Good morning and welcome to today's Healthcare Technology Summit. We appreciate you taking the time to join us as our subject matter experts share their knowledge on system modernization, healthcare supply chain, virtual health, and data insights. Prior to getting started, just have a few housekeeping details around GoTo. All attendees are in listen-only mode throughout the presentation, but we do encourage questions. So please put a question into the chat, put your hand up in the chat. We will be actively monitoring it and do welcome questions throughout the presentations. Also at the end of each presentation, we'll also have a time for a question and answer. One thing to note about this specific webinar, it does have an 11 a.m. kickoff time, but there are four specific topics that we're covering. So if you find that you need to jump off to take care of something and then want to jump back on, just use that same GoTo webinar link that you use to join right now. It will work throughout the next three hours as we go through the different sessions and, and different subject matter material. Oops, hold on here. Let me advance the slide. So first thing I wanted to just discuss is who we are. Some of you are aware of who we are, some of you probably are not. So Mazic Global Mazic Care was acquired by Quisitive this past spring. And we've been around for 18 years and were originally founded by three gentlemen that were deep in the development arm of Microsoft. Um, they um, set out to create industry specific expertise and Mazic Care was born out of that initiative to really use technology to drive better patient care, better health care, better health care operations. We are a global organization with offices, staff, and customers uh, located in several different countries. Uh, we have over 400 team members. And as you can see, we have a variety of different types of customers um, and healthcare organizations that, that we have supported over the years. One of the unique things about Mazic Care is that it's not a one size fits all. Because we have deep industry expertise and technological expertise to leverage, we're able to marry the two and provide very meaningful solutions that help our customers support ultimately their customers and their patients and providing good patient care. And whether it's an organization like Healthcare at Home that is trying to reduce the wait time for their patients at home, uh, or if it's um, Elrio Health that we're gonna hear from later today, in rolling out and, and updating a procurement system, informed diagnostics, modernizing some of their systems, universities that are trying to keep their staff, students, and faculty safe and engaged on campus through vaccine flow solutions. The driving force for Mesa Care, for Acquisitive, is to really leverage technology to drive transformation. And we're very proud of the work that we do and very appreciative of the customers and partners that we have. And on this slide, you can see that 2021-2022 Inner Circle logo. It's our third year of being recognized by Microsoft and that designation is reserved for the top 1% of partners that show a commitment to development, that show a commitment to driving transformation to Microsoft and to their end customers. So that's something that we're very proud of and um, feel very deeply in walking in our customers' shoes and providing those solutions. This is also something else that we're very proud of. This past year in 2021, we were recognized as the Healthcare Partner of the Year for the Mesa Care Solution and how that was able to drive transformative change for healthcare organizations. We were also recognized as a finalist for community response for our work around Mesic Care vaccine flow, which helped accelerate the distribution of vaccinations for the overall health of populations. And finally, this is a summary slide of really all of the different touch points that we have with our healthcare solutions and how our solutions impact data, um, how we touch different points within the healthcare industry supply chain, revenue management, and the biz app side, and cross over all three of the Microsoft clouds of Azure, Microsoft 365, as well as Dynamics 365. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Syed Fahad, who's our Vice President, Product Development Acquisitive, Rob Carrick, who's our Vice President, Acquisitive for Global Solution Development, and we're especially honored to have Dan Rosen, 
who's a VP of Technology Solutions at Inform Diagnostics. Dan is going to share the customer journey that Inform Diagnostics had along the lines of system modernization. With that, please uh, sit back, um, enjoy the thought leadership, and if you have any questions, we will actively be monitoring that chat, and we appreciate your time and appreciate you joining us today. Syed, I will give you control of the mouse, and you are all set. Thank you very much, Sue, and thanks for uh, joining uh, everyone on the call. Um, you know, means as we have prepared for uh, these webinars, right? We kind of start looking into how can we align best information uh, in a way which is most relevant to you. We all know healthcare, especially in the last two years, has gone through a significant uh, change. What I call it, you know, I mean, showed a relentless adaptability. Uh, to those unknown changes that come across. But we still are not over, or those changes are not enough as we move forward, right? As we look into, I was reading it, you know, this recent Gartner report, and what are the core business drivers coming to, uh, or, or focus from healthcare perspective, is really around uh, four key things coming out of it, the major uh, business drivers, right? The first one is medical technology innovation. And what it means is that you know, is there are a lot of new therapeutic or digital diagnostic or new care innovation model is coming, and the providers in general or healthcare organization have to kind of start reacting and aligning to make sure that they are ready to deliver those uh, you know, technology innovation within medical as an industry. The second key area is is not just how. Uh, medical or delivery of care is getting a lot of new innovation, but just the technology around, um, you know, is, is changing from cloud to data to AI, uh, especially based on the user adoption and the way uh, consumer looks at healthcare is significantly different. So that's the second area, what we call a strategic technology change is a core business driver. And the third area, especially for the providers, is this a structural change where um, healthcare is now not bound within the four walls of a typical hospital. It is going into the retail, it is going into the digital giant, it is going into a lot of other places, which means that it's gonna create a very different level of competition, which is great for the consumer, but it still create a, a new uh, pressure within the provider space to make sure that you're able to drive some new change and been able to compete with additional value in the services, right? And the fourth one is the most obvious one, the uncertainty, right? Uh, we have gone through COVID-19, you know, I mean, so I heard this morning from the news that Omni, you know, this new variant is not going to be a seem like it's not going to be as, uh, as we all were expecting, or it's not going to be that bad. Uh, but it's still, there are so many changes from supply chain, or so many uncertainties from how uh, consumers are going to, uh, you know, I mean, uh, take their healthcare into different, uh, you know, area and scenarios. So those uncertainties has a huge impact, right? And especially specific to COVID-19, those changes, which initially were temporary, that some of those changes will become permanent and the impact will be uh, unknown. So when we look into and we think about, you know, I mean, what, Sue has mentioned earlier from technology perspective, we're kind of trying to make sure that we're aligning or helping our providers to think first what the core drivers are, and then try to map the right solution for you to make sure that it makes the right impact. And that's kind of the approach every CIO, every uh, leader within the provider organizations uh, you know, has to take to understand what those business drivers are and how it's going to get impacted in each area. And with these business drivers, I usually kind of divvy up into it's not one department or one portion of the organization has to think about the business driver. It is a net or is a connected chain of reaction which need to happen. Um, uh, first, we need to kind of look into what is the business impact will come through from this, right? And when I look into the business impact side, um, there is a big push on the direct to consumer offering, right? Means and and that will create not only the new competitors, but also help you establish, you know, means new partners in the ecosystem, right? 
Uh, and the way to address some of those business impact uh, is to make sure that we are using virtual care or in-home capability, or remote monitoring capability, uh, or creating a network of partnership and referral, right? So healthcare doesn't need to be in one place at all now. It is going to get diverse. It is going to be, uh, you know, I mean, you have to work with multiple partners, but having a good referral and a way to track their care is going to be an important uh, aspect. The second thing is to create uh, a composability of your business scenarios or your business offerings or your service offerings and composability of your technology offering to make sure that you can, uh, you can, as things are changing, you're able to reconceive the same technology stack or same business offering or same uh, uh, consumer offering and repackage it with based on what the new different needs are coming in. The third thing is around. Again, you know, I means the similar composability will drive you or help you with the better value-based care, right? To make sure that the care coordination service offering that you have started for a specific subunit, you will be able to kind of recompose the same thing for other units, or you can mix different offering into one to drive the better value-based care uh, into the scenario. And then you have to also kind of think about new line of virtual care uh, to drive more you know, it's effective engagement with your patient, right? So it's not just having a, uh, you know, it's can we do a pharmacy delivery or can we do a virtual clinic, uh, but it has to be delivered more than just the two or three of these uh, functionalities or the services that we are looking into. Uh, the other areas, so that's more from the business impact standpoint. Now we have to kind of look into if business needs to drive in that area, what does it mean from operational impact, right? Uh, one of the key things coming in is that, as I said earlier, uh, the care is not bound to the four walls of the hospital, right? We need to make sure that operationally, we are in the space where, um, you know, I mean, operationally, we are in the space where care anywhere is a true fact, right? The second thing operationally, because of not just with the COVID-19, but there is a, a huge pressure on clinicians. And, and it is very important that we need to kind of create technology or operationally, we need to start establish SOPs, which help, um, you know, means a better clinician experience, right? And, 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 and make sure that they're able to drive or focus on the delivery of the care. The third area is really leveraging analytics, AI automation, uh, or to make sure that, you know, means we are providing a more connected and also self-aware um, <clears throat> operational um, solutions where, you know, means automatically based on AI, we can drive the burnout on clinicians and adjust their schedule uh, and things, you know, means of these nature. So that's going to be a very important thing. And as we have said, these new business models are going to drive uh, a need of much bigger, um, you know, means uh, uh, partnerships and relationships. And the interoperability is going to become an important aspect, right? That how do we make sure that we are able to connect with different partners, you know, means while we're campaigning or maintaining uh, the regulatory requirements and everything within that space significantly, right? So it's going to be a very important aspect uh, from that. So we kind of talk about the business impact. Uh, we talk about the operational impact. If I take it to the third level, uh, which is which is really the core around the technology impact, and you will hear me say this com com composable technologies. Um, this is where uh, we are seeing with many of our customers, and as we talk to many CIOs and CMIOs, uh, this is one area which in Microsoft term we call it, you know, it's low code, no code, Microsoft Power Ed platform. Uh, really focusing on to make sure you create uh, a composable cloud-based technology where you can actually be able to bring uh, different platforms or different solutions uh, pretty quickly, right? So that's an important aspect that we kind of need to uh, look into. And, and these uh, idea is that instead of we focus on one monolithic platform or a solution uh, to do it all, we build on this composable modular uh, kind of platform which help you 
um, create new solutions or very quickly um, you know, reconceive the similar solution for new use cases as we look into, right? The second thing is going to be focus around the data fabric, right? Everything is going to run around your data and how do we bring MDM or CRM type solution to accelerate value uh, in curing, curating the data for use, but also been able to provide a better patient engagement or physician engagement uh, in each of these areas, right? The third one is, uh, we all know virtual care is here to stay. It's not gonna disappear anytime soon, but <clears throat> video itself is not going to be, you know, is, is enough, right? Virtual health cannot just mean that we switch on a video and that's enough. Uh, we're seeing a big trend where, you know, means the even though that during COVID just having a video was good enough, but today consumers want to have a similar experience of doing the pre, um, you know, means pre visit, the post visit, uh, the whole experience of a typical in clinic session, but virtually. So orchestrating that virtual care, orchestrating that, uh, you know, means telehealth scenario um, is going to be important but we have to kind of connect it with the broader term of patient remote monitoring to make sure that we're able to get the right value to our consumer. And the fourth one is that, you know, means as we talk with the, with COVID in, with technology changes, with marketing in a way, with, with medication, you know, changes, uh, it's important that we're ready to make, um, you know, means or assess new newer technologies to determine, you know, means where uh, and how we can leverage uh, AI and, and other things to drive more motion uh, for each of the technology solutions that we are after. So these are the uh, few areas that we feel it is going to be an important. Uh, we have to kind of using the business driver, business impact, operational impact, technology impact is going to be a thing. So what we are recommending is that number one, we kind of reduce the lines on monolithic system by adopting composite uh, composable technologies, right? Having uh, technologies which can help us uh, or a platform which can help us drive uh, the, uh, the real or true value of a low code, no code kind of experience. Then harnessing the clinicians and other citizen developers to improve UX, right? So if uh, there are areas where clinicians really want to have a simple screen, uh, allow them to have some kind of citizen developer experience to make sure that they can adjust it uh, based on their need and, and only focus on things that they are, they're, they're, they're more, that, that's more important to them. Uh, then we also kind of look into or uh, think about investing in purely in data and AI uh, to create this whole relevant consumer experience. And what it means by is that help create a digital bridge between the patient, the providers, and the payers, so the consumer can really see and understand the, uh, you know, their health and the choices they are making, uh, to and and make a better health choices as you, as they get through. And the final one, um, final one is really to kind of start thinking: uh, Are we really a a true digital organization? or what are the key activities needs to perform? You know, I mean, my friend Rob uh, is going to kind of go through some of those um, specific steps could be taken, uh, but it is important that we are kind of uh, changing our reliance uh, from the monolithic system to a better, more platform, uh, you know, it's creating platforms or delivering platforms uh, to the clinicians and other key users in the system uh, in the healthcare to drive some citizen uh, developer base improve, you know, means uh, apps, uh, focusing a lot into the data and analytics, and then making sure that we are creating a true digital platform as we as we look into. So that's kind of the recommendation that we are hearing from many of our, as we talk to many CIOs, many other leaders in the uh, organization, as we talk to Gartner's and industry analysts too. Uh, so we wanted to, I wanted to kind of highlight and kind of drive that as we think about, uh, you know, moving into 2022, uh, these drivers and these recommendations could really help uh, organizations 
to create a roadmap which can enable them to achieve the true digital experience or true digital uh, foundation of the organization. Sue? Yep. Great, thank you so much, Syed. Could I jump in with just one question regarding, uh, before we uh, transfer over to Rob, where you mentioned the low code, no code aspect. Uh, is there any recommendation or school of thought? Does a, does a healthcare organization need to have a dedicated kind of center of excellence around power apps? Or um, how do they start that conversation internally about generating buzz and excitement over low code, no code solutions? So uh, we have worked with many organizations. Um, almost everyone once had the right, uh, you know, means experience. Uh, would love to develop more and more apps, but you have to follow a a methodology to make sure that you're establishing a center of excellence around Power App uh, to drive the motion. Think this way that you know you have to still create data standards, user experience standards. Uh, and other things to make sure that the citizen developers are really doing plug and play and able to produce something faster and then able to share and understand the impact of each of these things, each of these apps on the on the overall organization. So definitely center of excellence is a is an important thing. And Microsoft and uh, Inquisitive also offer a, a two days you know workshop just for the um, uh, for the Center of Excellence workshop to many of our customers that really help them kickstart uh, that initiative for, uh, and, and drive really uh, great momentum. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, so now we're going to head on over to Rob. And Rob, I'm going to give you mouse control. So you should be able to um, advance the slides accordingly. And Rob is gonna talk to us about some needs and solutions. So thank you very much, Rob. No, thank you, Stu, and, and thanks, Syed, and, and good morning or afternoon, everyone. Again, Rob Carrick with Quizdiv here, and I think Syed really did a great job at kind of painting the picture of what we're seeing across the industry today in terms of trends and opportunities and challenges. And, and I know for a lot of you, this is likely, you're, you could tell us the same exact story, so what we wanted to do then is talk about that what does that mean and when you face that kind of landscape what are we seeing customers doing and, and really at the core of this is for inquisitive around how to deliver a connected experience and so we look at that in terms of how to, we prioritize those different scenarios associated with those kind of challenges and opportunities that we're just talking about and for us, we're seeing three recurring themes around the need then to modernize legacy applications, especially those that are attached to clinical technologies, not necessarily the EMR, but all those things that support operations or other clinical operations. The reasons are, are really, as we were just talking about, it's truly about being able to accelerate development velocity, create better resiliency in these application stacks, as well as the ability to scale more effectively. Because today, we know that some of the challenge is in overcoming many of these kind of technical limitations of our application portfolios. But really in true terms of really enabling a connected experience, it's about being able to surface that data up from these legacy applications in order to start delivering actionable insights that are different than what you were able to do before. A nice downstream effect that we've discovered is that this in turn is helping improve employee productivity, not just because they have tools that are better fit for purpose, but because in modernizing the applications, the employees are able to more quickly get to the information they need as well. It all these things kind of tie together when we think about all of the different areas inside of the healthcare ecosystem in providing care around those kind of strategies around patient engagement, empowering that health team to truly collaborate from both the referring physician all the way through the entire care chain. And then ultimately, again, surfacing that data for clinical and operational insights that may not be available to you today. We think of this from these kind of work streams as well. So thinking from left to right in terms of why we start to modernize or innovate, and then as we start to really accelerate that change, and then Ultimately, we get to that plateau. We're in this wonderful, just continuous change state. 
we look at this across those different areas now. So if we start with our scenarios to say, we know we need to modernize and we know that we need to be in this application area, and we know that that's one of the critical path areas for us to really get to a point where we can affect that change. Now we're starting to layer together the reasons and the approaches for that modernization journey. What we often hear though is, you know, again, I do need a solution though. I get it, I know what my needs are and I've, I can tell you my needs, but what I also need is an understanding of how do you actually get there and and for many folks this is a could be a daunting journey about complete overhaul of their application portfolio but what we found is there's a great interim step and part of this is around how i develop a long-term roadmap as well as short-term solutions that can meet and reflect that need to modernize this application stack so when we think about this it's very much demanding an agile approach now in the marketplace where it's not about just trying to take everything on at once but how do i come up with that smooth change cadence how do i use that modernization pipeline to give me that opportunity to reflect on my environment this is now about taking bite-sized chunks and rationalizing through them so that we can understand where our opportunities truly lie where are we going to get the best bang for the buck and then ultimately what that looks like, both short and long-term, as we establish that pipeline. To dive just a little bit deeper, because I think that can be a very high-level description for anything, what we're talking about truly is, how can we leverage some of the native services in Azure for these applications as an interim step to provide development velocity improvements, to provide scalability improvements, to provide resiliency improvements that in turn are going to help to fulfill that mission of being able to connect the care chain, be able to enhance that engagement and truly provide the data in a way that's going to allow for more clinical and operational insights. So when we talk about these application architectures, this is leveraging serverless cloud compute so that we're out of the operating system management business leveraging microservices, API management, platform services, data stores in Azure SQL, all of these things help to give us better development capability, better application uh, maintenance and management. When we talk about modernizing the application at this step, again, outside of the, the full re-application uh, re coding for that application, this is really truly about a tactical step now of provisioning those things in Azure. I share this because not strategically it's, it's critically important, but tactically to recognize that there is specific steps that are taken to provision the resources, share the data across with Azure, so that that way there is a smooth pathway towards being able to migrate over to these applications in Azure. Is this the only answer? Nope, certainly isn't, but it is one of the answers that we know is a good short-term immediate lift that can help to improve the overall environment. When we think about healthcare and, and the intelligent health platform, we know we're looking at these four really, really important quadrants from lowering the cost for the care, improving the patient experience is always top of mind for every healthcare customer, but overall it's about the charter of healthcare to begin with and improving population health being able to use the data from the applications and the clinical systems for the benefit of the populations that you serve. Along with that then, again, is that downstream effect of improving the clinician experience and the productivity across the care chain. So I'm gonna kick it back over to you. I think we've got some really uh, informative dialogue from Dan Rosen at Informed Diagnostics to talk about their journey. Absolutely do, thank you so much, Rob. And that is a good lead-in to uh, head over to, let me get back some keyboard. Uh, to Dan Rosen. Uh, so as I said earlier, we're thrilled to have Dan join us today to share his perspective from a customer journey of the challenges that Informed Diagnostics experienced and, and how they went about uh, turning them into some great opportunities. So with that, Dan, uh, it's all yours.
and let's see here. Okay, we should be able to hear you now, Dan. I think that's better. Good. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Dan Rosen, and I think what I can do over the next few moments is kind of unify what Syed and Rob shared with you and really showed you what we took on as a journey uh, starting back in 2018. Uh, so just for so you understand who we are, we are an anatomical pathology laboratory, which means that we don't have a lot of direct patient interaction. We are kind of a secondary healthcare um, and more of a business to business model, just to kind of paint the picture for you. Um, but in 2018, we started forward with a vision, and that was really to connect the art of technology with the science of our lab operations and pathology to improve and optimize patient care as well as client and employee experiences. And in 2019, that started with us creating the Transformers. These were strategic projects, each with their own favorite robot, that used digital transformation to improve our company and our services. And these Transformer projects included te technology such as uh, replacing our laboratory information system, or LIS, replacing our ERP system, replacing our CRM system, replacing our HRIS system, uh, changes to our revenue cycle management, as well as then cloud architecture and data management. Now, those that's quite a daunting list there, but those first five you might recognize as more of your traditional application upgrades or replacement. But I want to expand upon our underlying strategy, and that was really to transform those core systems to be consistent with our company-wide platform architecture strategy. And I think that resonates with what Rob and Said were both stating earlier is that we know today, especially, that there will always be these kind of monolithic applications that serve particular purposes, and they're very good at it. But the true value to an organization is how you unify that those together and facilitate the movement of data between those systems. So when we did this strategy, uh, we found a couple benefits right off the bat. Um, in addition to replacing these core systems, we actually reduced the total number of applications we had. Um, with our LIS replacement, we had four different LIS uh, solutions with dozens of smaller helper applications that can all be replaced by one uh, modern application. Within finance, when we did the ERP replacement, we took a small accounting package with separate supply chain, inventory, check printing, budgeting, reporting, and lots of Microsoft's most popular finance system, Excel, all of those could be replaced by a more modern application that better meets, met our needs. Um, revenue cycle management's an interesting one that we actually looked at that function and how we were doing it and decided to completely outsource the entire operation. So we do not internally handle revenue cycle management directly anymore that's provided by a third party. But in addition to those actual applications, the strong point of what we did was built a messaging platform or service bus to handle all of the data integrations between those applications. This platform is expandable and vendor agnostic. It allows us to integrate applications, whether they're on premises, in the clouds, SaaS solution, or in the case of revenue cycle management, even handled by a third party. This is the definition of our platform architecture. And while we'll always have those applications that are fit for purpose, we have to realize that they function as part of our larger ecosystem. Some examples since then that we've been able to reap the benefits from is because of this platform strategy, it allowed us rapid expansion into new services as they came up. Uh, we built an entirely new service line for us to perform COVID testing in 30 days and is fully integrated into our existing ecosystem. Uh, before we took that on, we would not have told you that was possible, but because of the tech underlying technology, it was really easy to plug in additional growth opportunities quickly. And then the second one is that uh, we built a client's mobile application within 12 weeks, and this is not a standalone application, but fully integrated to read our lab order statuses and integrated with our CRM environments. And while we don't have a lot of direct patient access, 
this solution actually speeds the delivery of data to the clinicians who are in front of the patients. The next topic I want to move to is, uh, or the reason for this modernization is to improve our resiliency and responsiveness to changing business conditions. Um, the reason for taking a cloud-first approach was to recognize our own internal limitations. Uh, don't get me wrong, I am very proud and have a great team, but there are limitations to the resources I can onboard, both from a people and a dollars perspective. Uh, we are a nationwide company with labs across the U.S., but historically, if our main location had a technical problem, all sites were impacted. We wanted to remove that dependency on any one site impacting other sites. And by moving services to the cloud and to SaaS cloud providers, we greatly reduced our risk of an outage. A site issue, whether it's related to power, weather, or other uh, disasters, may impact one site, but the other sites can continue to perform as normal. Uh, we tested this greatly with recent events. In 2020, there's this little event called COVID that happened. And I believe for all of us, COVID was and still is the ultimate business continuity test. The con COVID pandemic forced us to move non-essential staff to work from home in roughly a 48 hour period. And some of our digital transformation saved us while we did this. Our usage of MS Teams grew with 800% in one week. And this would not have been possible if we were still running our on-premises Skype server. In addition to being able to support our business, it became just a lifeline to those staff who are now isolated from the rest of their teams. There were just as many wellness or how are you doing social calls as there were business meetings. And that was critical to the company and our staff continuing operations throughout 2020 and 2021. Had this been an on-prem, this scenario would have severely strained our technical capabilities but because we made some moves to the cloud, we're easily able to scale and continue operations. Another event that tested our resiliency in February 2021, the state of Texas suffered a deep freeze that triggered a number of cascading disasters. And for those of you who live in the state of Texas, I apologize for bringing up this painful reminder. Our main site in Texas is luckily on a primary power grid. We are across from a hospital. However, roads were impassable and our staff at their homes had loss of power, heat, and even water due to this disaster. In addition, our telecommunications carriers were suffering the same issues. We saw major disruptions to telephone and data services across all vendors. Um, we had plans to replace our aging PBX, but we didn't do so in time. This recovery though did include our move to a new cloud PBX or phone solution which now we can manage all phone traffic remotely or from in the office. <clears throat> the next bullet that's critical to all of us to think about is how do we manage data? Um, the modernization can certainly help improve existing capabilities, but it also creates a platform to grow and create new opportunities. And for us at Inform, we are able to leverage data now in two ways. Uh, using more modern technology, we're able to improve our existing data warehouse and analytics for faster decision-making capability. Um, Multi-hour updates that used to run now take minutes, and we're able to get business information updates now throughout the day, meaning that it's no longer an overnight update, but we can do uh, same day or multiple times throughout a day updates of our business performance. And as these different components came onto play, we're conscious of how much data we're actually sitting on. Due to our regula regulatory requirements, we're responsible to keep data for up to 20 years. And prior, this data just became a cost burden for us to physically store. In our industry, there's an advent of something called digital pathology, which is the scanning of the pathology slides so they can be leveraged as a digital image. We can take advantage of the mountain of information we have and leverage it to advance technology such as AI. To give some context, we have over 20 million slides in storage, which leads me to my final point. And that's reducing the capital outlays and improving return on investment for solutions moving forward. Something like digital pathology is daunting when you look at how much data is generated. We estimate at our full capacity, we'd be generating two to three petabytes of data per year. 
trying to plan ahead and purchase the capital equipment necessary is a bit like Field of Dreams. We would build it, but then hope they come. Leverage to scale as necessary and have the cost closely aligned. And Susan, I'm just checking, you can still hear me? Yes, hear you loud and clear. Okay, good. Uh, as technology fails me today. Um, the difference though is that prototypes can be, can be built quickly and even production systems can be built to current needs and rescaled easily when and only when needed. Being in regulated industries, we can keep our lower tier environments such as dev and QA, but keep them offline until needed, which dramatically lowers the total cost of ownership for an application. I hope our journey helps you envision what's possible within your organization. And I hope it also comes through that none of what I shared had to do with the amazing technology that exists in the cloud and the modernization, but ultimately what it can do to help your company and its mission. Because ultimately that's the end goal of technology. And I think that's it, Susan. Oh, that was that was excellent. Wow, uh, I totally and I know you all haven't forgotten in Texas, but for those of us living outside of Texas, yeah, that double whammy of the pandemic and then followed by that weather that that hit Texas in February 2021, some some real challenges that uh, that that you were poised to take on. Could I ask one uh, one one quick question before we move on? Um, because it's it's something that always I even wonder about within my own internal organization when you want to influence change. You had said that this started back in 2018. Was there a specific tipping point around that? Or uh, when organizations are looking to take on modernizing systems or legacy systems, is it a matter of what could have the quickest impact? What's going to maybe be the hardest tackle that first? Or how, how did you all set that this is the time that we're going to do it? What was the tipping point, I guess, for that decision? Um, I think ultimately, and unfortunately, this may not translate well to other companies, is it was really a change of leadership. Um, we had fresh people coming in who were able to look at the existing organization and capabilities versus where we thought the company needed to go, and really then take that time of being, quote, new to the organization to drive those solutions forward. Um, I don't think that's needed all the time to drive these, but is really having that objective look at your current capabilities and how well or how not well they're meeting your business objectives. Nope, that's uh, that, that's really good advice. I think all too often perhaps we we create workarounds that becomes our new normal and then we get so used to our new normal that it just feels normal and whether it's a change in leadership or perhaps an opportunity to have an outside person come in and do an evaluation in some sort of a, a system or a part of an organization. It does breathe that new light into, into how things are operating. So congratulations, really great, uh, really great uh, case study and, and really great path forward for you all. Great, thank you. All right, so um, wanted to do a check-in. Nelly, are we seeing any questions or answers that are um, showing up in the in the chat? or anybody have their hand up? Um, I'm seeing two, I'm seeing one question in the chat um, by Rajan Benkot, which is, were you able to get the ROI measurement pre and post? Was that, uh, uh, let me try to take um, uh, Raj off mute, because it's I think that's probably a question for Dan would be my guess. There it is. So, um, okay, Rajan, I have taken you uh, off mute. If you can, uh, you're self-muted right now, unmute yourself. You should be able to uh, ask that question or if you could just respond back in the chat. Was that a question for Dan regarding the ROI? Uh, yep. Okay. So we're gonna. Uh, uh, Dan, can you um, take that question? Uh, 
were you able to get the ROI measurement? Let me take you off mute there, Dan. Sorry about that. Let me go back to staff. I think I have you muted. All right, Dan, you are unmuted right now. Yep, no worries. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, yes, we did do ROI calculations for all the projects. Um, we all have masters we report to and they like to make sure that we're doing this. However, some of these projects actually were not just done for ROI, pure financial benefit. Um, especially if you look at those like business continuity or improving your resiliency, uh, those ROI calculations are pretty difficult unless you look at your dramatic, you know, complete business disruption. So I will be completely honest, some of our solutions actually cost more than what we were doing previously. But when you're able to stop a business outage or disruption, that instantly pays for itself. So while we did do ROI calculations and and the majority of them were positive. Uh, at the same time, we did look at that we know we're changing some features and capabilities or even just adding complete new ones that were we didn't have solutions before, like that platform uh, of data integration. Perfect. Thank you. And let's see here. And then there is a question from Alexandra. What percent of your headcount is offshore versus sh um, onshore? Is that, um, so, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll answer, but I think it could also be a, an answer for Quizive and Mazik as well. Uh, so we are, you know, for Inform, we are 100% onshore. Perfect. And then for Quizitive, um, Syed, are you still with us? Let me unmute Syed. Uh, Syed, you are self-muted. Is that a question as far as on our headcount, percent offshore versus onshore? I think, you know, it's a good uh, percentage of our uh, industry consultants are based onshore, and, uh, but a lot of developers are offshore. But, um, you know, it's we kind of leverage the onshore, offshore combination based on customer ask and, you know, means how, how customer wants to kind of integrate and work with us. Uh, it could be, you know, I mean, 80% onshore and 20% offshore, or it could be 20% onshore, 80% offshore, whatever the combination a uh, customer will like. But a typical structure, most of the industry consultants, co-drivers, and everyone are onshore, uh, and then we try to leverage uh, offshore more as a development capability than industry capability. Fabulous. Thank you. And thank you for the questions as well. And that wraps up our system modernization. Um, we do have one other um, slide that I'll, it'll be distributed with, with the deck, but just some suggestions on how to get started. Some things to look at when you get back to your organization. Uh, obviously change is always a, a, a tough part of any type of organizational change, uh, any type of a process change. So we will include, uh, we will keep this slide in the deck and then, uh, we also have this slide to surface as well. Um, all of our sales team and our folks are specially trained by Microsoft in the Catalyst framework, which really is meant to um, have workshops, look at really what the customer is trying to solve and approach it from a, a business problem solving standpoint, and then trying to leverage and match the technology around that. And so that concludes our system modernization. Bear with me for a moment, and I'm going to flip on over to our next topic, which is supply chain. All right. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through these first introductory slides because we already covered them under system modernization. Um, again, we are recording all of these and we'll make the recordings as well as the decks uh, available uh, sometime within probably about a week's time. Uh, so let's talk about supply chain, which 
is all over the news these days and has always been a bit of a challenge in the in the healthcare environment to begin with, but certainly the pandemic has uh, surfaced some new new challenges and highlighted a lot of different areas. And I'm gonna jump right over to uh, our speakers. So we're thrilled today to have as our speakers, Tim Snowball. He is the Director of Procurement from El Rio Community Health Center. He's gonna share their customer story and the journey that they went through as they were launching and updating a procurement system. We have Pat Becker, who is our Chief Strategy Officer of Healthcare Acquisitive, and Kashik Ramakrishna, who is our Practice Director of ERP Acquisitive. So with that, uh, Tim, I'm going to give you some keyboard and mouse control so that you should be able to uh, advance the slides or if for some reason you cannot just uh, flag me and I can advance them for you but uh, you're taken off mute and you should be good to go. Great thank you so much uh, thanks Sue for the opportunity to present to the group today and uh, thanks to Mazic Inquisitive uh, for all the work in putting these types of events together uh, always appreciated. Um, so let's see if I can progress the slide here. There we go. So El Rio Health is a <clears throat> community health center, a federally, federally qualified health center that if you're not familiar, uh, got started when uh, we had the war on poverty from President Lyndon Johnson back in the 60s. And El Rio Health has been started since uh, that time in 1970. Uh, to help combat that specifically here in the Tucson, Arizona region. Uh, the services that we offer are direct care to patients, you know, primary care, dental, radiology lab, pharmacy, behavioral health. And over the years have uh, had a slow growth for decades and then over the last decade really vamped up and, and started to provide more services to our patient population here in Tucson. And uh, with the help of you know, really focusing on what is needed for providing the right care to the right people and uh, taking advantage of all the payers and Medicare and Medicaid that's out there, we're able to be a pr profitable organization to always reinvest back into our organization uh, and really have grown to what we call a medium-sized organization, right, with $250 million revenue approximately per year. I just wanted to give a little bit of background on who we are and, and where we've kind of come from as an organization uh, so it makes sense on the supply chain side and what we've done and where we've come to be. A little bit of history on um, the supply chain side. Trying to progress the slide again here. Let's see here. There we go, sorry about that. Um, so for the first 45 years, supply chain was not supply chain. I mean, how many people knew what supply chain was, you know, decades ago? It's only been in the last probably uh, 10 to 20 years that people have focused on uh, supply chain being its own organization with, you know, department within an organization. And that was true for El Rio as well. Uh, we were under the umbrella of the facilities management team for quite some time, 45 years, and only six years ago did purchasing become their own department and reporting structure. Only a year ago did El Rio invest in additional leadership and starting to really hone in on what is needed to ensure that the supply chain is healthy for El Rio's success. And again, why was that necessary? Well, we've had a lot of growth over the last 10 years. As we've seen our volumes increase dramatically with uh, about 450,000 encounters per year, um, uh, serving over 10% of the Tucson population. And uh, it really is seeing a growth as we've expanded our services to more supply chain items being utilized. Uh, coming from my background in hospital supply chain, it doesn't quite compare. Uh, hospitals are more robust and have more complexities than a community health center would. Uh, but nonetheless, the importance of being in tune with your supply chain is equally important to ensure that we can always provide that care. So as we've grown, it, it got out of grasp a little bit and we needed to rein that in and, and focus. 
as we've heard uh, and we all know about, the pandemic has identified shortfalls in nearly every supply chain. And we've seen things that we have never seen before in the history of trying to transport and manufacture and purchase the things we need. Um, we also, through that, identified some talent and experience. Um, the way we were managing our supply was not efficient that we needed it to be. And uh, started realizing that we weren't alone and that some of our part vendor partners also needed uh, to strengthen their supply chains. The lack of transparency was one of that, that our distributor partnerships were lacking and still in some cases are lacking visibility to forecasting. As an organization, unless I have my own distribution center, it is required that I rely on a distributor. And so it's very important that uh, I have some visibility into what they are doing on my behalf and we are we need to become stronger partners in that uh, and not look at them as a vendor or a supplier but rather a partner and that they are an extension of my supply chain um, that would give us more line of sight to what's coming down the line and how to be more predictive in the direction we're going and one of the issues we also had uh, prior to the last six to 12 months uh, was that we had multiple report sources. And now putting this all into one ERP, which is what we've done through Mazic Inquisitive here, uh, has given us some of that better structure and, and support technologically. So steps to our supply chain improvement, we needed to completely reorganize how we were managing our supplies from a central supply warehouse perspective, uh, centralizing our inventory control in each of our clinic sites, as well as in our warehouse, and doing that with the support, as I just mentioned, of the uh, new ERP system. Uh, we focused on a lot of 5S lean methodologies and really outlined the, the ways to eliminate waste and be more efficient in each of the steps that are required to run our supply chain. Those are more hands-on, not necessarily technology focused. We go in and kind of clean it up, what I call blocking and tackling. We needed to focus on those things so that we could then have a cleaner process to put into a technology uh, to be more supportive of where we were going. Uh, the new ERP system, as uh, many of you may know, it, it encompasses item master, requisition purchasing, inventory receiving, and then all of our financials as well going through that system. And now through the use of uh, Dynamics 365 Finance and Operations, which is what we utilize today, we're able to have that all encompassing and linking together. We're in our infancy through that process, but we are seeing great immediate results in more transparency, more visibility, better reporting that allows us to uh, build up to a place where we can hold more accountability to ourselves in you know, tracking against a budget and being predictive in how our inventory levels can be appropriately stocked and ensuring that not only do we have enough, but also equally importantly not having too much as that was an issue for El Rio prior to this uh, reorganization. So some of the benefits that we've seen come out of this uh, that we're going to continue to work upon and, and bring forward for ourselves El Rio are these things listed here. Warehouse items, uh, we have continual movement. We're seeing Orders come in, transfer orders come in, we're able to pick and process and ship those out with rapid speed, at times uh, delivering the product within hours of the order to our end users. Uh, we're able to have automatic, automated reorder levels for our warehouse, uh, so everything running on a min-max, and as simple as clicking a button, we can see how much have we used, uh, what is needing to be reordered, and keep that uh, stock sufficiently in place for us uh, to ensure we can always provide that to our end users when it's needed. 
Um, our PO confirmations, uh, they're a lot more timely and available to us. Uh, again, that transparency, we're able to now, through the use of uh, CXML orders, transitioning back and forth through the vendor, we're able to see if something was wrong with the order and take action on that. Uh, and it, we always have uh, sufficient stock on hand now, or if we see it starting to slip, again, we have that time that we can uh, start to put in and ensure that we never get below our critical levels uh, to have items in, in hand. A great stat that we look at is uh, we managed, looked at how many hours were being spent by clinical team teams when they were managing the supply chain, when they were placing orders. As we've now centralized that, we've been able to free up over 5,000 hours a year of clinical time to put back into clinical activities. And we've been very successful in what those end users are able to see and feel through our use and their use of this new system. Uh, we're working towards a 95% plus uh, of purchases being placed on purchase order. Um, part of that need for us is that we can instill proper controls through the system with an approval hierarchy that we put in place in the system uh, to allow us to ensure that the right people are made aware, yet empower our leaders uh, to run their business appropriately uh, towards their budgets. Um, achieving, uh, I just spoke on the approval hierarchy, the, the ability to process orders with a three-way match is also freeing up a lot of time. The three-way match capability allows uh, an order to match a receipt that matches an invoice and it automates that process for payment uh, that, again, will help us to be more efficient in our steps, uh, utilizing the technologies that come through the system. Uh, managing inventory at point of use, we're also doing with MinMaxes that allows it to be sped up a bit more and more efficient. Uh, again, I talked about overstock and the stockouts that could occur, and they're both issues. Um, and so this new, the new processes and our min-max capabilities is allowing that to, to be a successful process forward for us. Um, and I talked about how we're able to plan better and, and how we've saved some of the steps and, and time, paper, and money in all of these processes. Uh, before all of this, we used to print 11 pieces of paper for one PO, and now it's one, sometimes two pieces of paper for every PO that we that we cut. So uh, a lot of this technology steps forward is showing vast improvements for us and our efficiencies. We still have a lot to do for our next steps in sourcing and contracting and RFP work and how we'll utilize the system for that. That's kind of a phase two approach for us, but our blocking and tackling is in much better situation now. And, and now we're driving forward to continuing to be more strategic in uh, how we improve our supply chain for our organization's success. So I believe that's it for me here. Um, uh, let me know if you have some questions. Uh, otherwise, turn it to Sue and, and Kaushik. Okay. Wow, those are some amaz amazing statistics, and it's uh, fascinating to see El Rio place supply chain as such a strategic part of overall healthcare and patient care. And looking at this slide that's up right now, the outcomes moving forward, um, the, the number of hours freed up is amazing to me, as well as the 95% of the purchase orders on POs, and then you just mentioned that 11 pieces of paperwork. Um, did you expect at the start of the project that it would have this type of an impact, not just on the clinicians that you have on staff, but ultimately for the end game of patient care? Obviously, El Rio must have felt that it would make move the needle some, but some of what you've shared here is moving the needle a great deal. Uh, what ones were the surprises out of out of the uh, steps that you've taken? Yeah, I I think uh, especially on the hours on the clinical side, as I came into the organization just over a year ago, 
And I learned that I would have a health center manager that was spending 20 hours of their week managing supplies. It was a shock. And um, I think that as, as we recognize that that registered nurse or whatever their role clinically licensed is, they didn't go to school and college and all this training to be a supply chain inventory specialist. So uh, we need them to be at the front of our patient care. And uh, having these new processes and system in place has allowed that to be freed up across the organization. And that's the largest benefit. Um, but the paper too was a big surprise when I came in and saw how much paper was everywhere in our processes and to be able to eliminate and shrink that down and have things become more efficient with that was a huge win for our for our organization. No, absolutely, absolutely. Great uh, uh, great, great journey that you've been on and uh, exciting to hear that your journey is still continuing as well and uh, looking for ways to still, you know, improve on everything around procurement materials management and ultimately to drive that patient care. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Absolutely. All right. Uh, Nelly, do we have any other questions for Tim that are out there? If not, I will move on to introduce uh, Pat is up next. I'm not currently seeing any questions. All right, let me get Pat off mute. And move forward to all right so the importance of supply chain management in healthcare uh pat becker is going to take us through this part of the session and pat uh let me give you keyboard control would you just so that, i'm sorry you keep the keyboard control oh okay absolutely i will continue okay. to move forward so okay here's your first slide and just let me know as to uh, how to advance them okay thank you so much uh, it's it's going to be hard to follow the great story that Tim just told, but uh, <laughs> that is a yeah amazing amazing. Best here. So as we all know, that the supply chain is like the second most um, cost within any healthcare, especially hospital organizations. Um, the the first cost, of course, is is staffing. Um, so we can see that you know the the cost is on average 37 percent. Um, millions are spent annually, and um, oftentimes we have no idea of exactly how much we have on hand at any any point in time. So um, I'm not going to read these slides to you, but so would you go to the next slide, please? Sue? So one of the big things that I think Tim brought up in his um, presentation was the need to be able to forecast what, what it is we, we're going to need into the future and to do contingency planning. If the pandemic showed us anything at all, it was that our contingency plans were insufficient to uh, address what was going to happen to us, even though um, in the U.S., we had fair warning because of what was occurring in China. We didn't really pay as much attention to that as we should have. And um, as you've heard throughout the, the morning, um, you, the use of AI analytics um, is going to be important to determine what kind of disruptions we may have in the future and be able to plan for that. And another thing that occurred during the pandemic was consumers and patients lost confidence that um, healthcare organizations were prepared to to meet um, what was going on in the country at the time. And all of these can be um, addressed by making sure that we have all the data that we need. And the way we can have that data is to make sure that the systems that we have in place are collecting that data so that we can do forecasting, we can do what if scenarios, and we can look at what was missing from our COVID forecast that in the future we need to be prepared for. Where do we get this data? We can we get it by having robust systems and the necessary tools that are able to analyze that data. Next slide, please. 
So contingency plans, I mean, most um, hospitals are required to have contingency plans in place. It's usually a state regulation. Clearly, though, those plans are insufficient for uh, COVID. The plans need to be updated now. Based on that experience, we need to determine where the short, uh, shortfalls were and to be able to adjust for those into the future. We need to do some stockpiling, but stockpiling is expensive, so we don't want to overstockpile. And we, so we need to find secondary and tertiary sources for supplies. Uh, one idea that's come out is, you know, to work with um, hospital organizations like your GPOs, or uh, other organizations you're involved in and determine if there are, you can partner with organizations in other parts of the country um, so that if you run low on something and they're not facing the pandemic quite yet, they can supply you knowing that you'll reciprocate when they, knew, when they need it in the future. So strengthening alliances for that will allow for that sharing. I mean, you can barely pick up a newspaper at this point in time without reading about issues in the supply chain. So we have to uh, work on rebuilding consumer uh, confidence so that they know that um, we're, we are prepared, that we're prepared not only to take care of patients, but that we're prepared to make sure that our staff, our staff is safe as well. Um, so that will require some marketing of your organization um, to keep um, people from being afraid to come into the organization at this point in time because they're going to know that you're prepared moving forward. I think the really interesting experience that occurred in Intermountain, there was a news story about three weeks ago where they put out a request for people to look in their attics and basements for crutches because they were running out of these devices. And so they were asking people particularly to bring in metal crutches or other walking assisted devices that they might have lying around their home to help them fill that need. To me, that was a being very proactive and showed that the organization was thinking ahead. They knew they had a shortage. They probably looked everywhere they could to find these things. And so finally, they were just very honest and went public with it. So I think that was a very a positive thing for them to do. Next slide, please. So most hospitals say they only that only 50% of hospitals say they have the tools they need to do the kind of analytics that are really needed to determine what supply chain um, needs for forecasting are in the future. So forecasting it sort of is a predictive way of determining what you need in a month or two months, or if you're seasonality, like when there's a flu epidemic, but it can also help with predicting what you might need during the next crisis. Again, demand matching, um, optimizing the logistics, making sure. Tim talked about this in his presentation. Now that um, they have a robust system, they're able to have continuity in their supplies. They're not having shortfalls like they want today. And then automating basic tasks that um, you may have uh, a human performing at this point in time. Next slide, please. Supply, supply chain supports patient care, as we all know. It, uh, it helps with making sure that the physicians have the equipment they need to provide patients with the care they need when they need it. Operational analytics then allows us to predict what is going to be needed into the future. And clinical analytics allows us to marry the clinical knowledge with the operational knowledge so that we're sure that we have the, the supplies there when patients need them and the care providers uh, have what they need to do their work. I think we're turning it over to Kajik. 
Uh, yep, absolutely. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, appreciate that. Let me get uh, the next slide advanced here and hit Koshikov mute. All right, here we go. Challenges, opportunities, and objectives. Kashik, do you want uh, keyboard control? Uh, no, so you can drive. Um, just okay. over to the next slide. Yeah. We can hear you. Uh, what did I lose? Did I mute you by accident? There we go. Uh, Got you back. Okay, so I'm going to advance to the first slide in your section then, okay? Okay. There we go. Okay. So, um, you know, some of the typical healthcare challenges, which, uh, which Tim kind of mentioned, and uh, Pat kind of walked through some of those as well. Um, you know, mostly we see in how do you manage your power levels? How do you manage the seasonality factors? How do, how do you how do you really manage? Uh, you know what what is the minimum I'm supposed to stock and and reduce some wastage? How do I get data from from my EMR so I can I can uh, you know actually plan based on some of those appointments and schedules, right? So so a lot of these factors um, kind of drive supply chain um, and some of the efficiencies which we see in other industries. You know, bring it over to healthcare. Um, you know, we we also uh, were working with companies uh, or, or healthcare organizations like uh, DuPage Medical Group or El Rio or Midwest Vision, um, and and we kind of um, you know started hearing the same challenge uh, and decided to kind of take on that challenge and and kind of come up with a solution that could that could meet all of those needs. So. Um, we, we started hearing from everybody that they need an Amazon style experience to, to be able to order supplies, uh, just because they didn't want the staff to focus uh, on ordering supplies, but, but wanted them to focus more on patient care and reduce some of those training costs, reduce some of those usage costs, reduce some of those support costs, right? So, so we kind of came up with this solution um, which helped uh, DuPage Medical Group manage 765 locations with people in support um, and and six people in procurement team, right? So so that's that's kind of the return on investment we are talking about, and and uh, people are able to get through their their orders in 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 two to three minutes versus uh, you know 20, 20 to 30 minutes where they had to fill it out on a paper, send it to somebody else, and and then you lose track of the paper. So so, so we were able to overcome most of those challenges, and um, and 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 that's one thing there, right? And and data, as we all know, uh, is only as significant uh, if if it's actionable and if it's reportable, and and if I can if I can drive some insights out of it. Um, but with the paper based, you you never really have access to this to the data. So so with connected systems, um, and and uh, you know. Uh, the things that we have done, you, you're able to get access to the data, to the pricing, the variances, uh, you know, quantities, month-on-month uh, -month comparison charts. How much am I supposed to really stock? Uh, what is the wastage? Um, inventory levels at various locations, sitting at the centralized location. So, all that really helps staff, uh, you know, uh, do their job uh, in in a much more efficient manner. Um, we also a lot of, saw a lot of challenges related to people using disconnected systems. So AP runs on a system, procurement runs on another system, managing inventory on another system, connecting the dots, uh, providing providing the data, uh, you know, providing those workflows to get really challenging um, for 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 people, right? And and with a platform like D365. Uh, you can um, you can you can turn on on the modules as and when you see as as and when you need them. You have everything under one single umbrella, so so that, that kind of helps uh, through the process. Uh, next uh, next slide, sir. So. so um, you know, as I mentioned, um, and and as Tim kind of spoke about on his slide too. Um, 
the the opportunities that we have for SEM is uh, is kind of huge. Here, um, where you know the EMR stores the item numbers and the catalogs in one format, and then you have your uh, procurement and supply chain system storing it in another format. So we try to uh, kind of uh, you know try to build that uh, integration layer and try to merge these data together. Um, so the procurement team um, and, and the inventory team get real visibility to what's happening uh, at the pa at the patient level and what's happening at, at the warehouse level, what's happening at individual clinic, right? So so that that gives you a, a detailed approach, um, and and we also kind of uh, you know um, eliminate the need for a year long implementation cycle, uh, you know. Um, where you have 10 different training iterations and people are still not using uh, comfortable using the system um, they're getting frustrated right so uh, a simplified experience and and decoupling each process uh, kind of helps uh, navigate those issues and and it helps in faster deployment systems and an easy support process uh, you, you don't need a 20 member support staff to to kind of support people right so so that simplifies it um, and then uh, with the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare, uh, the D365 platform, uh, as, as I mentioned, the, the patient data, the data from EMR, uh, any system can be connected one to another and, and it, it makes reporting and, and life so uh, easy on, on, on that front. Um, so next slide. Yeah, the, most of the is um you know um we obviously we want to eliminate all the paper based processes um and and get everybody to uh to 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 more like a no p uh no po no pay system right where uh each each person or each department owner is taking account account for for his own spend right and and we have the right approval levels and authorization levels to be able to audit the spend back or or to be able to uh, control some of the spend, um, and not just for supply chain. It could be for capex. It could be for for anything that that you're purchasing through the process, right? So <clears throat> that's some of it. Um, and and leveraging the benefits of cloud environments. So I was working with a customer um, who are using on-premise version of a, of a procurement software, and and literally they needed 48 hours to to back up a database, uh, restore it on an uh, to just to just to get the data out right with cloud it's just a click of a button and it it happens in um, in 15 minutes and, and you have access to real-time data and reporting so and and uh, you don't have to uh, you don't have to do daily backup so a lot of the a lot of the unwanted IT tasks uh, it significantly reduces the cost and, and operate and increases the operational efficiencies. So and uh, of course, with uh, with more visibility to um, to your procurement and and prices and real time uh, real time reporting, you're able to negotiate better pricing with your suppliers, better GPO contract usage, uh, right? So so all of those and and definitely makes it more scalable. And 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 uh, you know the business is driven based on decisions. So next one, do we have any? Okay, okay and then we get into questions and answers. Thank you so much, Kaushik. Really good, um, really good summary of the challenges and the opportunities that are there. I do have a quick question. Uh, there's a, there's a common theme that Tim touched on. Uh, well, several common themes between the Tim touched on, Pat touched on, and then what Kashuk was just talking about. And what comes to mind is really the anticipation of shortages in materials or transparency of how are my supplies going to be impacted. Is there any school of thought or suggestion for a provider? Pat, you had mentioned how kind of in the United States we didn't really pay attention too in detail enough to what was going on overseas, but how can a provider, um, or, or Tim, how does El Rio, how, how do you know if there's going to be something happening upstream that's going to affect effectively 
impact you? Are, are there ways that healthcare providers or organizations can can mitigate that? And I'm not sure if, if anybody wants there to. There we go. Can oh, you hear me? Sorry now? about that, Tim. <laughs> yeah, Tim. thanks. Um, so that that's a difficult answer uh, or problem to address. And today, what I'm doing is using multiple sources to try to learn and be aware of what's going on and think through how does that affect the whole supply chain trickle down effect. Uh, when I know that Chinese New Year is coming up, right, then I know that there's probably going to be a temporary blip in an on-down chain of manufacturing from overseas, right? So something as small as that can have a small impact. It's not going to be overwhelming, but to be aware of those types of issues globally that are going on, and being in tune with your distributors and your manufacturers and knowing where they are sourcing their products from, whether it's domestic or overseas, or do they have a, a local warehouse that it doesn't matter and it can absorb that kind of impact and it's gonna be fine for us and they'll rebound, right? I mean, there's so many complexities. However, there's so many things going on globally, it's hard to be able to keep track of them all. And mm -hmm. I, it's something that I'm actually looking to research more and get invested in is I have heard of organizations out there that have global supply chain implications that you can look at. But then I think the challenge is narrowing down that their information to what's relevant to me. And I think there's still an opportunity there uh, where we can be a little bit more tuned in to a solution that is challenging the marketplace today. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I think I think too also, you know, people need to go and look at where they had shortfalls when the pandemic hit and how they might be able to mitigate that in the future. Um, and and to do real serious scenario planning. Uh, and then look for alternative um, suppliers um, that they can have in their back pocket. Mm -hmm. if, if their primary supplier uh, fails to come through. Yeah, yeah no, if, great. if I may, one other comment. You know, I think the gut reaction is to start to essentially hoard, right? Maybe open up my own warehouse and start to keep it all myself so I know I can take care of myself, right, our, or our organization. And I think that there's some value in doing that maybe as a temporary fix to an extent, but the problem really relies around how can we become um, a national and global supply chain that can be supportive of one another to ensure that the, that visibility, that transparency is always there uh, so that we can collectively address things going on in the market, um, especially in healthcare, uh, so that we can always take care of our patients. Um, you know, if I can't find something retail that I'm looking to purchase on a consumer basis, you know, something personal for my home or whatever, it's not going to be as critical. But when it comes to this healthcare space, we're talking about sometimes minutes or hours when I got to have that supply. You know, I, when I was in the hospitals and, and there was a surgery going on, uh, you know, there's times where it's a matter of minutes that you've got to have that supply on hand. And if you don't, there's going to be a critical outcome to someone's life. And, um, you know, being that this is a healthcare conversation, it's something that I'm passionate about. And, and I think that um, we have to, as, as an industry, find a way to get everyone on the same page to be more transparent uh, so that we can plan better. And that is still a challenge a little bit today. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And to your point, it's in the end, the patient care that is that is the most critical and freeing up resources that provide that patient care, uh, nurses specifically and other, other, other staff, but the supplies certainly. So it'll be interesting to see the to Pat's point, the lessons learned coming out of the the pandemic and 
how healthcare supply chain can work to drive that transparency for the for the greater good of population health. It's uh, very very interesting. But you're right, the initial knee jerk hoard create my own, but so expensive, um, and then could be prohibiting others from helping their own patients. So it's a tough one. Yeah. I think since we, I think we have Intermountain Healthcare on the line and some other good healthcare organizations. A thanks to organizations like that that help drive this at a larger scale and get on that political campaign. So thanks to all of those healthcare organizations that help drive that. Yeah. Well said. Well said. And then I think there is one other slide coming up that I believe is Pat. So yep. So Pat. Um, helping folks get started internally um, on supply chain transformation. It's all yours. Okay, thank you. So these are um, KPIs that have been developed by the American Hospital Association. And it was interesting to see um, Tim talk to several of these um, when he was uh, talking about um, the return that his organization had seen. We, you can go out to their website and get the full definition of each of these. But if you're looking for a way to start, you need to know where you are today and where you want to go. So looking at these uh, different elements within your organization, Tim talked about wanting to get to 95% of, of supply purchasing going under PO. So how much of your spend is currently managed spend as it as opposed to unmanaged spend. How many FTEs do you have in the supply chain versus um, you know, your total uh, non-labor expense? So um, we will include this slide and um, you can see the source is, is, is on here as well. So that's our recommendation. Know what you're doing today so you can improve moving forward. Thank you, Sue. Perfect, thank you. All right, and that concludes our section on supply chain. Do we have any questions in the chat or anybody have their hands up? At the moment, I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, then we will move on to our next topic of virtual healthcare. So let me stop showing my screen for a moment while I get that teed up. All right. Uh, oops, let me see here. Slideshow from beginning. Okay, our next session that we're going to be covering is on virtual healthcare. And that certainly uh, has been around for some time, but certainly has come to the forefront, especially during the pandemic. So I'm gonna advance through these early slides because again, it talks about that introductory um, material from the, from the um, system modernization and jump right to who our speakers are for this session. So we are very fortunate to have Antoinette Tony Thomas, who is the Chief Experience Officer of uh, Microsoft for their um, US health and public sector. Pat Becker, our Chief Strategy Officer, will be joining us again on this session. And then Suresh Krishnan, who's our Chief Technology Officer for Healthcare at Quisitive. So let me uh, get Tony off of mute here. So Tony, you should be able to unmute yourself. And I'm gonna give Hello. you control. Hi, Tony, we can hear you loud and clear. Pardon? Oh, can hear you loud and clear, thank you. Right. And thank you so much for, for joining us today. We very much appreciate um, all that Microsoft has done with the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare and other industry clouds, and providing such a great, uh, and providing such a great secure and scalable um, um, cloud, and look forward to hearing your um, slides on virtual healthcare. Thank you for having me. So are you able to advance with the keyboard? Do you want me to advance your slides? Um, I'll have you advance. Okay. Thank you. And here we go. 
Well, um, thank you for the introduction, Sue. Um, as you stated, my name is Antoinette Tony Thomas. I'm with Microsoft. Um, I function as the Chief Experience Officer. I also happen to be a clinician, so I spent about 17 years um, in clinical practice, but I've been out on the industry side now for 15 years, um, really focusing on um, data aggregation, data analytics, and specifically around patient experience and what is now really kind of shifting into a more consumer-centric environment um, in healthcare. Next slide, next slide, please. So I'd like to start with this slide because what, what this really gives us, and this is, whoops, I think I advanced. There we go. What this really helps Microsoft give you all is, um, you know, what we have been working on as far as what a journey looks like for a healthcare consumer, which we like to call health citizens. There's a great author out there by the name of Jane Saracen Khan, and she has termed the lingo of health citizen. And I think this is really the direction that consumers of healthcare are heading. And at Microsoft, what we have noticed and have, have identified is really um, the opportunity around three digital hotspots um, in this entire journey. So in those three digital hotspots, um, we can see that there is the well health, wellness, and prevention. I'm gonna pause for just a second, there we go the health, wellness, and prevention. And so that's, what's, that's what happens on a daily basis when we focus on healthy activities, wellness acti activities, mindfulness. Um, and the majority of the population participates in health, wellness, and prevention. And then the second hotspot would be what we call uh, illness, so diagnosis and treatment. And this is what would happen inside the four walls of a healthcare system or a clinic. And at some point in time, we're all going to need treatment of some sort, whether that's for an acute or chronic illness, whether that is um, a procedure that we need to have done or some sort of accident and injury. So that, that aspect is really not ever going to go away um, in change in the way that clinical care is deliver, delivered around um, diagnosis and treatment. And then the last hotspot is one that we call maintenance and equilibrium. And most people spend their the, the good amount of their time maintaining their health or trying to be in a state of equilibrium. And maintenance and equilibrium would be maybe potentially utilizing some form of treatment um, or care management. And certainly health plans fit into this category in this bucket. And if we look at this journey, we can see here that there are various touch points along the way that identify um, where virtual health is currently being used or where there is potential for virtual health to be used. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we proceed along. Next slide, please. And I know you're all on this you know, this webinar and you're all leading healthcare systems or leading some sort of operations in healthcare. And so you're keenly aware of the current landscape that we're in. Um, these are just some identified themes um, that we have been really involved in helping our customers with in the last 18 to 24 months. So the first one is the increased labor shortages. And, and now we're experiencing labor shortages across the board in all industries, but um, most specifically, I'm referencing um, the workforce crisis that we are now in, um, which it, it this can be challenging for me to talk about as a clinician because it's really, it's hard and it, it, it touches my heart that healthcare systems are going through this, especially you know, with everything that's going on with the pandemic in general. Um, so increased labor shortages. There is an increased demand for care and we're seeing this, Microsoft is specifically seeing um, and having conversations with our healthcare customers around the 65 and over age group. Uh, because what we're seeing here is more of a demand for care in the home. And that's a touch point for virtual health because 
remote patient monitoring and care in the home is uh, an area of industry that just is really um, in, in a period of accelerated innovation and investment right now. We have a rapidly changing regulatory environment. Um, we have new business models emerging, and this is a direct consequence of, um, I would say, it was happening before the pandemic, but it's been accelerated um, as a direct consequence of the pandemic. So, um, you know, different outpatient models, certainly virtual health, telehealth, behavioral telehealth, um, care in the home, and we're also seeing an emergence um, and acceleration of retail health, as well as direct-to-consumer models, business models. We have an expansion of public and um, population health care systems, and then the retailization of health care. Next slide, please. So what we've, we've done is we, we've taken this landscape and we've really assessed it and monitored it. And we've, we kind of have distilled it down into four different buckets here um, that we have noticed as far as business dynamics. And this is important to talk about in the world of virtual health and how healthcare, healthcare models have changed specifically in traditional healthcare systems. So there is this, um, this, this pressure uh, for revenue growth um, we have um, more focus on population health management, certainly around value-based care models and how, how's, how's virtual care being utilized um, in our um, private insurance payers. Um, and certainly there is a keen eye on what will happen um, long-term with Medicare and virtual health. Outpatient model pressure, I mentioned that a little bit earlier around these different business models that are emerging and not only emerging, I'm receiving a significant amount of um, venture capital dollars or investment dollars for innovation. So I think this is something to really keep our eye on as an industry because um, the puck is moving very fast on the ice as far as that, that is concerned. And then value-based care. Um, so we know up to 30% of our current healthcare do dollars or spending is wasted. I think the pandemic has laid bare um, a lot of health inequities and other inequities. So, you know, how can we still keep an eye on value-based care um, and continue to accelerate its, its progress and its success? Next slide, please. So winners in the post-pandemic health economy, um, I used this slide to talk um, to various organizations um, inside traditional healthcare, but certainly also health plans and also um, retail health organizations that I work with. Um, and I'm not gonna go over each individual segment here, but I think the important takeaway with this piece of content is that for the first time, um, I think ever really, the consumer or you know, the customer of, of healthcare systems or those who are consuming healthcare systems are really, now in the driver's seat. We were seeing an emergence of this consumer-centric behavior prior to the pandemic, but it, it was really just pushed past the tipping point during the pandemic because the options were so few for consumers, and rightly so. Um, you know, we, we had to really clamp down in healthcare systems um, to, for health and safety reasons um, and, and to, present, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So, this consumer-centric behavior, these consumer-centric changes have really caused a par paradigm shift from what is known as a traditional patient's experience and moving that toward a more consumer-centric uh, experience of which virtual health, I would say, is really a foundation. Um, during the pandemic, we saw um, virtual health access um, uh, increase to about 80%. Um, now we're at an average of about 35 to 38% across the board. Um, that's anticipated to, um, you know, kind of grow over time. Um, certainly with um, the various different types of virtual care that will be offered by the healthcare systems. Next slide. Uh, Tony, can I interrupt for a quick second just to yes. ask about one of the items on the slide? Yes, absolutely. So that lower left box, consumer loyalty is lowest where demand is increasing. Yes. Is there um, 
I mean, competition breeds advancement. Uh, competition breeds things getting better, typically. But when it comes to patient care, um, is there anything that a provider or a hospital organization really needs to be aware of? Because at the end of the day, you want the patient to have the care. And if it becomes kind of a little bit of a competitive battle about where someone's going to go, is that anything that a hospital can try to ad ad address up front with how they offer their virtual care to kind of try to increase that loyalty or that touch point with that consumer? to keep yeah, them with them? That's a very good question. So we're seeing something um, in the market that we like to term coopetition. And right now, there's, there's a lot of um, competition uh, between um, primary care type services or urgent care type services from retail health. That is a space that is grow, has grown by leaps and bounds during the pandemic. They certainly had a footprint prior to the pandemic but you know, with the way that healthcare systems had to protect their, their patients that were hospitalized as well as their staff, retail health grew. And you know, they have the minute clinics, they had the virtual health offerings, they have the health hubs, um, you know, whatever flavor of, of, of whatever you know, retail health outlet I'm referencing. I'm, I'm really talking about CVS um, mm -hmm. with their model. So healthcare systems have recognized this. Um, and I, I think they're in the understanding like they're not going to come out and battle retail health to the ground because that's really that's a hard thing to do, um, you know, with the way that the retail health offers its model. So what we're seeing in certain pockets and areas of the country is that healthcare systems are maybe going to the CVS or the Walgreens of the world and say, hey, listen, you know, um, we know that a certain percent of the market shares coming to your organization to utilize various types of primary care, urgent care services. Um, we might not be able to compete with the price point that you're offering, but maybe we could go into partnership and we could ensure that anything outside of the services you're offering would be referred into our system. So we're seeing more and more of that. Okay. We're also seeing healthcare systems um, really working very, very hard on the things that retail health does well, um, and that's around health and wellness. And the consumer really does want that aspect of their own health and wellness and what they're doing on a daily basis to be brought into their traditional healthcare experience. I hope mm -hmm. that was helpful. Yep, it is actually, that, that, that partnership piece as well. So thank you. Thank you. And then just closing out, um, I think that, um, you know, there are so many different flavors of virtual health and what that is or what that means. And I, and I certainly don't want to insult anyone on here, but I do have to, you know, gently remind people that virtual health is just more than a video interaction on a virtual or video platform. Virtual health can be done by telephony, so it can be over a phone call. Virtual health can also be done via chatbots. Um, so I just, I, I like to challenge certainly traditional healthcare system and what their thoughts and ideas are around growing their virtual health program. And I think the foundation of it is, you know, how do you retain certain aspects of your market share and gain mar market share by improving customer loyalty and trust through your virtual health platform? And that's really, in, in our mind at Microsoft, that's how do we help our customers um, provide a virtual health experience that is a knowing experience? Like, how do we help you know your customers or consumers or patients and how do we create um, really using the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare and the Teams component of that and the CRM component of that as uh, a way to create a, a longitudinal experience, a record that is integrating different clinical systems that you're already invested in and, and pouring that into the virtual health experience. And that is an experience that we not only want to be able to 
have a patient have a delighted experience. We want the people providing care in, in the healthcare systems to also have a delightful experience. So we think about that in terms of how we help our customers solution out virtual health. Excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, Nellie, do we have any questions at this time or hands up for uh, Tony or anything that she's covered? Not at the moment. Okay, perfect. All right, well, thank you so much, Tony. Those are uh, pretty uh, pretty impressive stats for the way that virtual healthcare is going, and it's uh, a very interesting time to be, uh, be, be a patient and also be a provider right now, that's for sure. It is. Thank you. Okay. So next, uh, Suresh, I just took you off mute. You're just up. There we go. I'm going to advance this forward. And Suresh is going to take us through the components of virtual healthcare. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And uh, can uh, Sue, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. So I just wanted to come on the video and say hello, and then I'll take myself off. Um, thank you for uh, the introduction. I think uh, for the people on the call, uh, I came to Kuziru after spending 25 plus years in the provider space. I worked in health system as a CIO and CTO of our multiple health systems in the Chicago market, starting with the academic institutions, safety net health systems, uh, suburban health system, and a, a national health system. So I have experience in four different types of provider space. And my experience with uh, telehealth has been mixed. So I wanted to cover a couple of those samples and then I'll talk a little bit more about what Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare brings into the picture. Starting with the, the patient engagement side, uh, starting the medical home to patient wearables, the ability to collect data from uh, home-based devices, getting them into a, a database which is linked to the patient care is uh, much easier now with this technology. And uh, we, I worked with the one of my health system. We did, uh, did chronic care management using wearables and uh, pre-pandemic days. And uh, second is empowering care teams, virtual care. The definition of virtual care you heard from Tony that it is uh, varies from organization to organization. Uh, the large, last health system I worked at, we deployed uh, televisits uh, one part of virtual care uh, about five years ago. And uh, we had the interesting experience of uh, training physicians to work like contact center agents, which is which was tough five years ago when telephysician, when they, they make themselves available as a resource, they need to mean they are available. They cannot just go get coffee, <laughs> et cetera. I think that we have come a long way from that uh, scenario. And uh, on the uh, optimizing clinical operations perspective, we have done a lot of virtual virtual rounding, for example, where a physician can do rounding without having to visit the uh, clinical unit using camera-based technologies, video, non-video technologies, et cetera. And uh, on the transformation side, remote monitoring. Uh, we in our health system, we did remote ICU monitoring, for example, when you had 19 hospitals, it's uh, impossible to have an engineering team watching patient monitors in 19 different places. We centralized a lot of that, uh, staffed up with the uh, nursing uh, staff to do a centralized management with the monitoring and backup plan and alerting. So there are a lot of opportunities there. So you wanna go to the next slide, Sue? So? so you saw this patient uh, health citizen journey with uh, Tony Sher earlier. This shows a little bit uh, um, acute care centric model of that same journey. I think we are, we are starting with the uh, virtual health bot as your initial interaction to either to get assistance or to pick the right physician, for example. And once they're uh, selected the physician, your televisits could be set up with a physician virtually and uh, your appointments can be facilitated by a virtual bot. And uh, uh, once you have to schedule an appointment with the lab, you, uh, the lab uh, unfortunately requires specimen collection to be a personal uh, event. But uh, as with the COVID has shown us, a lot of the specimen, which are non-invasive specimen collection can be done through drive-through, et cetera. 
once you are inside the hospital, a lot of the, uh, I mentioned tele uh, rounding, virtual rounding, and once you leave the hospital, again, follow up care does not require you to go back to the physician office. You can do a lot of it to televisits. And then uh, the consumer-centric data platform is allowing you to do follow-up care, reminders, prescription management, or wellness management. Most of them are becoming digital and virtual uh, technologies. So I want to go to the next slide, please. Okay. I, so uh, I wanted to bring up some uh, about the set of solutions. For example, uh, Kuzitu has developed a, a set of solution on top of Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare to provide specific so, uh, uh, components to provide patient engagement, provider engagement, supply chain management. I think in various sessions, we are talking about some of those capabilities. Uh, and integration with your EMR. And I think the next session, we are going to talk a lot about uh, integration as well. I think uh, we, uh, we have the ability to uh, integrate with your EMR using FHIR standards. And um, as you know, FHIR has brought in some data standardization beyond what HL7 provided us. So we'll talk about it later as well. Next slide, please. Uh, Pat. Thank you, Suresh. Um, so it was almost like the pandemic overnight um, caused an increase in virtual healthcare. Um, uh, physicians were no longer seeing patients in, in the outpatient setting unless it was a, a true, true emergency. And so we saw that like 80% of patient visits became virtual. This was like um, many organizations had the technology in place to do virtual visits, but it got stretched to the limit because before the pandemic, virtual visits were like less than 10% of a normal organization's um, visits. So, uh, but patients actually grew to like having virtual visits. I know, um, the millennial generation is like, okay, can I do this virtually? They want to do everything virtually. Um, and so they'd rather do a virtual visit if they can than to go and um, travel and, and so forth. So virtual healthcare is here to stay. Um, it has decreased back, as, um, as Tony said, to about 40% uh, of visits at this point. But we'll see as technology improves, that number uh, will go up again. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. The, the virtual visits also had a profound impact on providers. Suddenly, they were expected to use a technology that they really hadn't been trained on. Um, and they were concerned about what um, doing these visits would mean to reimbursement. Um, fortunately, the industry um, came to came forward and, and providers, starting with uh, Medicare and Medicaid providers, uh, immediately said, yes, we'll cover these visits just as if the patient came in into um, uh, your organization. But there were still issues. Um, while if I go to a physician's office and I'm put into an exam room, I might be willing to wait 15 minutes or 30 minutes for the physician to actually come on. I'm certainly not going to sit in front of uh, my computer screen waiting for the physician to show up. So there's a need for behavioral change on the part of the physician as well as the patient. And then there's the whole integration of the virtual technology with the provider's electronic medical record. And you know, initially that was uh, problematic, although it, it, it has been improving. And then the ability to use diagnostic equipment. Sometimes um, the patient would be asked to take the temperature 
or perhaps their blood pressure if they had the equipment available to do that. Payer had uh, definitely changed quickly in this environment. Um, they, um, you know, came came forward and agreed to uh, change the payment standards for virtual visit. What you're also seeing is that payers are now doing some of the virtual components themselves, where they're creating um, virtual interaction uh, with the people they provide. As an example, I have my um, smartwatch uh, connected to an app that uh, my payer gets information on my exercise level, and they give me a bonus every quarter if I keep it at a certain level. So they're becoming proactive in this virtual market as well. And then you have payers like uh, Aetna which, and CVS, which are connected. So you know that there's going to be more interaction between the, cons um, the virtual visits in, in those payer organizations um, and their ability to try to promote a virtual health. So integration, you know, <laughs> continues to be an issue. Um, while we um, have seen a tremendous, um, and, and I know Suresh in, in the group, yeah. there's some more detail on that later, but, you know, we've just added another component now, right? Yeah, have virtual technology that needs to be integrated. So I think I'll leave the, the most of that in the next presentation. Yeah, we will uh, address this. Yeah, we will address that in the next session. Okay. Next slide. Please. The one thing that still is out there is the whole credentialing issue. So credentialing is where a payer, I mean, a provider is licensed usually by the state. So uh, as an example, uh, when I was CIO at the University of Chicago, we saw a lot of pediatric patients from Indiana. So if the, if the patient's coming into Illinois to get service, then the physician needs to be licensed in Illinois. However, if the patient is in Indiana and they're doing a virtual visit, with the physician who's located in Illinois, that that provider also has to be licensed in Indiana. So we're beginning to see some multi-state validation, but um, that is not moving along as fast as the technology is. So this will continue to be an issue for the foreseeable future. And I don't think we'll ever get to a national credentialing system, but that's my uh, personal opinion on that. So, so are there any questions? Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Suresh at this point. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. Uh, that was very helpful. Uh, in terms of uh, cloud for healthcare and the uh, technology landscape, whether the aim is to improve patients' experience or improve clinicians' experience our work on the uh, improving population health versus lowering cost of care. There are so many data points. There, many, there are so many opportunities to do virtual visit. I think I'll make a, 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 a share one a quick story. I mentioned about physicians behavior in, in a televisit environment was an issue five years ago. It is not. The data integration is still an issue. Last week, I tried to make a televisit appointment uh, with a televisit provider uh, recommended by my payer, but they have no data on myself. So uh, they, they, I had to answer the same questions multiple times. Uh, like most millennials, uh, are, are, a lot of people of our generation who are technical don't have the patience to do that. So I ended up going to a urgent care center. And many of you know, urgent care centers are not uh, cost effective way of doing business. But when you, are, when you are in a hurry, you are going to pick those solutions. We need to make telehealth solutions uh, customer friendly. And that comes from data integration, a lot more uh, user, in, uh, user friendly approach to tele, telemedicine. So we are working through, there are a lot of tools out there. Um, this is a slide of 
potential opportunities in a lot of these areas and we are working in all of these areas there are questions i'm here to answer from i actually have um a, a quick question yeah. um, so one of the one of the, the benefits of virtual healthcare is that people really can take control of, of, of their health and they can interact with physicians and providers in a lot of different ways now. But is there concern or is there anything that a provider can do to mitigate outdated health information? Because if they're dealing with someone virtually, there are certain things that they maybe cannot fully assess, um, changes in weight or something that might put them into a higher risk for diabetes or something like that without that personal touch point is is there anything in place from a technology standpoint that can help providers prompt patients to make sure they're keeping their records up to date or is that a concern around virtual health care the basic demographics uh, beyond your address and other things uh, the basic health status in terms of uh, your known allergies to your current insurance to your current weight to blood, uh, some of those uh, data elements. I think the uh, frustration people feel is about having to repeat that. I think the more and more integration we do, and uh, with, uh, like I said, uh, the fire standard, there is an opportunity to do things differently where the system can uh, uh, request the data from another reliable source. In a larger health system, it's much easier to do. But uh, when uh, when an organization is setting up a tele televisit, I'm talking about just the televisit portion of telehealth because there are million components of telehealth. The televisit portion, whatever the platform that is being used for televisit, it's tied to the primary EMR of that particular health system. And uh, as long as the patient is uh, previously known to that health system, that data should be available. For a per patient coming in from a different health system, due to geography changes or due to other reasons, I, it, it will be okay for them to repeat some of the data. Even there, if there is a way to query the other health system and get the data, uh, that would be the optimal scenario. And more and more of IoT, um, you know, thermometers are Bluetooth enabled. Uh, uh, blood pressure cups can be Bluetooth enabled. Um, uh, the ability to weigh yourself on a Bluetooth enabled device. Those things are are there. And um, sometimes uh, payers are actually paying for patients to have those things so that the, they can do better monitoring, like in the case of diabetes. So I think we'll see more and more changes in, in that mm -hmm. as time goes on. Yeah. This is Tony, and I couldn't agree more with with both points. And another important aspect of being able to provide an experience for patients or customers with virtual health that's ideal is utilizing that relationship management piece of it, which really is founded in the, the CRM. You know, we have the electronic health record as a clinical source of truth, but the CRMs are really emerging as the customer source of truth. So what are mm -hmm. the patient profiles that are in those CRMs, how do we integrate that seamlessly into our virtual care experiences? Yep, and yeah, what solutions can then le leverage all, and, and, and our next session is on uh, data insights, um, because then we have more, more and more data and how to leverage that into that whole connected care, virtual care um, experience for both the patient and the provider. Okay. Oh, Tony, nice. could I um, ask a, a question? regarding, um, I guess, opportunities that providers have with virtual healthcare. Because one of the pros and advantages of it is to be able to reach at-risk populations or maybe underserved populations. Can you address anything around the landscape of that and how that is indeed a really great opportunity, not just for great patient care that maybe otherwise wasn't there, but also it's an opportunity for providers to expand their footprint? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it's something that we're paying close attention to right now because you know, ideally, virtual care increases the access to care for everyone. However, you know, we there were issues with health equity prior to the pandemic, but I think that it's it's just this open wound that's been laid bare during the pandemic, and we really realized 
what a problem it was. So at Microsoft, one of the things that we really try to do around virtual care and in and, and our other solutions is making sure that this tool for good actually doesn't increase the amount of inequity. So with that said, in the virtual health area, what we try to understand with our healthcare customers is, you know, like out of your market share, out of your patient population, how many people do have access to a desktop or a laptop or how many people are signed up for your digital front door, your, your, your my chart or whatever portal you're using? How many people have access to mobile phones? Most people have mobile phones. So there's that issue. Like, do people have a device that they can use to have a virtual care visit? Another big issue um, that we're committed to solving for is the access to 5G. Um, because a very a good, robust virtual health visit really does best when, when it's humming along on 5G. And we still have pockets in our country, um, certainly in urban areas, but, but most certainly in our rural areas where they don't have 5G access yet. So we just want to make sure that this tool for good is good for everyone. Yeah. Well said, well said. Yeah, I think I'll add, can I add one comment to that, Tony? I think oh, absolutely. Access to um, health is a major issue, even in urban areas. In uh, uh, so, like uh, in the safety net health system, I work, where I work, we are uh, serving underserved population, mm -hmm. and uh, meaning to lose uh, the requirements are so stringent. Uh, I found a loophole which said if the you do not have uh, connectivity you can get an exception i said perfect because most of my community didn't have connectivity when i looked into it the connectivity availability was measured at the county level and my my uh, service area was in a county which was the one of the most connected counties in the country but my service area was not and mm -hmm. that was a tough uh, gap i had to work with cms to fix so there are a lot of those issues uh, play into it, but I think, the, like uh, Tony said, it's a smartphone availability, 5G connectivity, and uh, is uh, getting making things better. Yeah, and just one more comment. It, it really goes along with the equity piece. Is the digital fluency is something we pay very close attention to. You know, we are living in a digital economy um, across all industries, but. Um, the people in our country have different levels of digital fluency and we need to make sure um, that when we're scheduling virtual visits that this is this is easy to do across the board for people of all fluency levels so that's another thing to take into consideration especially like tech companies as we're creating these solutions so is it is it easy to use is it easy to use and how can how can we also support training um, so people can use these tools? Yeah, the the training is uh, definitely definitely a big a big part of it because the more the demand, the quicker people need to be able to react, and the training can sometimes lag on that. So yeah, excellent. All right, Nellie, do we have any questions from the audience or any hands up right now? I'm not seeing questions um, or hands right now. All right, then wonderful. Tony, Suresh, Pat, thank you so much for your discussion and all the talking points around virtual healthcare. I think as, uh, as was said, it is definitely here to stay and offers a lot of great great opportunities and um, also some some challenges around it, but, uh, but certainly I think more, more, more opportunities than, than challenges in the environment. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second and queue up the next PowerPoint. Thank you very much. All right. Let's see here.
All right, our next session to close out our, our day here, and thank you all for staying with us, is gonna be on data insights. I think a common theme throughout every one of these presentations today has been data. So much data, um, how to really leverage it, how to really understand what the data is showing, um, and, and how to take action out of the data. Uh, so for this, we are going to have Rob and Suresh. Let me take Rob off of mute. And we have Suresh self-muted. Perfect to kick us off here. So let me just advance the slides a little bit. And thank you, Rob and Suresh, for taking us through data and healthcare scenarios and how to really take all of these mountains and volumes of, of data and get some action plans around it. And I think Rob, you're you're up first. Do you want me to advance the slides? Oh, how did I mute you again? Sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> here we are. I was like, I know that that's not on my side this time. Generally, yeah, I'm the one that has technology muted, issues. Yeah, I had the slides. I must have got my mouse over there a little bit too far. So sorry about that. So. No, 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 no worries at all. If if you don't mind, I'm happy to go ahead and uh, advance the slides, or you can do it for me. Either one. Okay, I, you have mouse control right now, so you should be able to move them right ahead. Great, thanks so much. And and I think, Stu, you teed this up. And again, thanks to everybody for hanging with us. We talked a lot today about the importance of data and the importance of modernization as a real fuel for being able to access data to really enable a lot of the insights around both clinical and operational uh, challenges and opportunities that we are all facing together. What I wanna do in my short time with you here is to start talking about some of the things that we have been seeing as to how data has been used. And I'm gonna turn it over to Suresh, who's gonna to talk to you a little bit more about just kind of how then we have worked with customers to enable some of these uh, data-driven insights that have improved their overall position across that quadruple focus of our healthcare providers around patient satisfaction, physician engagement, quality of care. One of the first things that we have been really working in depth with many of our healthcare providers on is around patients not coming to appointments. We know that this has been a challenge for years and years, and, and one of the very common approaches today is a one-size-fits-all. We know that having that loss of patient is not really even as much of an operational challenge as it can be a actual quality of care challenge. The follow-up visits, the initial visits are all very critical parts of the care chain in ensuring that the patients are adhering to the treatments that are scheduled for them. So when we think about the operational aspects of this, there's certainly consideration for the loss of that appointment time slot that could have been used for another patient but it also then can increase wait times for other patients as well. So when we looked at the primary approaches around no-shows, what we found is that data can actually be a very helpful enabler in really altering our approaches to helping get better adherence to patient appointment times. Using variables such as demographic data, time of day, insurance type, geographic location, all of those things we found have been helpful in determining which patients respond best to what types of uh, communication in helping to reduce the amount of no-shows for patient appointments. So again, one area that we found really truly hits across all of those four segments of the healthcare quadrant. A companion to that then is looking at all of the patients and looking to determine what their propensity to pay is. We know that while insurance is one of the primary factors in our patients choosing a healthcare provider, geography being a close second, we also know there are very many other factors that can be part of uh, an early determiner whether they have the ability to pay and whether or not they'll have the propensity to pay. This isn't just about addressing all of the rising premiums or copays. 
or just simply, again, adopting a one size fits all around requiring all copay, all upfront, all the time. Because we know that sometimes that creates a very barrier to actual the, the treatment plans that we want to try to avoid. First and foremost, we want the patients to get the treatment that they need. So this is much more about not just the non-payment, but really is the non-payment as it kind of relates to the previous scenario. What we do is use data to detect patterns in your clients that can help determine which clients are more likely to have a challenge when it comes to paying their bill. This also can be something that has to be reevaluated over time because it's not simply a one time, this patient is going to not be able to pay their bill, but more what are the factors influencing your patient populations that ultimately may lead them to avoid care because of their inability to pay. Together, I have mentioned that the core of this is about care plan adherence. That's across medications, it's across appointments. What we know, whether anecdotally or otherwise, is that patients that adhere to a medication regimen and to a treatment regimen do better than those that don't. Especially chronic care patients, whether that's kidney disease or other chronic illnesses, uh, we know that they have a lot of things from lack of transportation to uh, inability to remember appointments that may impact their ability to actually adhere to the care plan. Similar to what we're doing around ensuring that patients adhere to their appointments and are and do have the propensity to pay, that would often then include them being able to make their visits. We're using data to identify at-risk populations that are showing that they may have a propensity to not adhere to the care plan. This truly leads to important inflection points where we can specifically touch the patient and intervene to try to reduce the amount of inadherence that we're seeing across patients. Last on an operational note, what we think that this helps to enable as well is around materials management inside of the organizations. Not just across surgical supplies, and, and those, by the way, are really crucially important. This is across the entire care chain. The goal is to leverage data to ensure the proper par amounts of inventory items kept at any given time, and that they're properly positioned for where you might be delivering that care. Surgical materials are usually more uh, closely managed and controlled, although there's room for improvement with data. We focus on this because while surgeries generally happen in centralized locations, which makes this a little more straightforward, that same concept can be expanded to all of the materials that you use in both provisioning of care and operation of the healthcare system. This centralized live dashboard can be used to alter and adjust your purchasing behaviors, give you better sense and management of those materials with your suppliers, and ultimately make sure you have the materials you need when you need them to support the patient care. I focused a little bit on what we're using the data around. Suresh, I'm gonna turn it over to you now yeah. to go ahead and talk a little bit more about yeah. how this translates. Yeah, I wanted to share one use case uh, around care plan adherence. I think we worked with a large client in uh, uh, in UK, where we were we built a customer centric platform for them to manage home care visits and prescription delivery. Part of the work we did was to deliver drugs on time and plan the visit such a way that the injectables are uh, arriving at the right time. Uh, nurses are arriving at the right time, uh, administered. So one of the interesting data points we found out was that this client was losing a certain number of customers on a regular basis. We they had done a lot of BI type analysis to see why they left them, whether they got better, they uh, ended the treatment well, uh, they uh, died, they moved, they don't like us anymore, whatever the reason was. 
one of the interesting proposal we made to the client was it is good that you find out why they left you wouldn't it be nice to know if they are going to leave you so we took 10 years of data did a, a, a machine learning algorithm to look at everything they provided plus the weather patterns of the region of the country and uh, their other social determinants of health around those patient population created a data model which basically told them uh, what is the target age range of a patient who could be dropping out next what could be the the drug of choice the most likely the person who is on that drug who is going to drop off what is the most likely reason and we what we discovered the most interesting thing we discovered in that analysis was is not the person who complained a lot who left you the person who has not called ever and the, the the our crm system proposed a solution to them which said make a call once a month to this patient so the adding that call saved them millions of dollars in lost revenue there were both components both as, a, as an organization which was distributing the medication as well as providing care they are interested in keeping their business intact and from a revenue perspective at the same time patient care perspective keeping the patient healthy because they are very conscious about dosage and delivery of drugs on time uh, they do get take it very personally when a, the, the dose is missed due to delayed re delivery so we work very closely with them use of data in that aspect was very very eye opening back to you rob All right, so I think I can advance the um, yes. next slide for you, you, Suresh. Oh, thank you. Let's do that. So in, ter in terms of data, uh, I think one of the issues we dealt in healthcare uh, provider space is a lot of silos. I think uh, uh, many of you know, we worked with the uh, HL7 standards over 25 years to make sure uh, transactional data is shared between systems so that we don't have too much duplication all of that so we allowed people to replicate data across multiple system using standards but there has never been an attempt to bring the data together so the when the data comes together is when you can provide insights which are brings you more knowledge about things it lets you make informed decisions it can reduce risk to a delivery of care and uh, uh, so analyze the data to make sure that your services are on par with or are better than competition and you can create personalized treatment of course and uh, and uh, potentially lower costs because there are silos of data which may indicate duplication of processes or products and uh, we can eliminate those as well next slide please so uh, i want to share one of the use case one of the solution sets we have built like where, where there is a data layer we built on top of microsoft platforms which are using my uh, azure components which will allow you to bring data in from your EMR systems, one or more. I came from a health system where I had four EMRs and uh, uh, across 19 hospital and 250 clinics. Uh, so bringing the data into a uh, singular database and then having to, using the tools to build solutions on top. We have built solutions which are uh, consumer-centric solutions, which can be portal, apps, uh, or could be non-interactive non items, whether it is uh, data we are providing for education or self-service. And then a CRM-centric solution, which allows patients or consumers to keep their data uh, current, as well as keep them informed of the data coming from the health systems from a CRM approach rather than from an EMR approach. And then of course, we build solutions around the ERP to by improve supply chain around patient care and there are custom solutions we have built for example we built a, we automated the a green book used by uh, pregnant mothers in the uk we replace them with a power app which they can carry with them 
and the data is shared with all the caregivers without having to lose the paper. And uh, there are AI-based solutions, whether it is cognitive services identifying people in the OR or identifying the implant or using augmented reality to identify the right size of the implant rather than, like uh, most our surgeries, when there is an implant uh, happening, uh, the supply chain requires them to send five different implants, what is the expected size of the implant, plus one, plus two and minus two. And if, uh, if uh, one of the customers we worked with is to analyze it such a way that we can bring it to plus one and minus one, reduce the exposure of five implants to so down to three, that will save them so much in uh, other costs associated with that. So those are a couple of the use cases. Next slide, please. Again, we talked about multiple opportunities to collect data across systems. Uh, whether it is related to improving clinician experience or patient experience, or improving patient or population health, or improving operations. And uh, these are all these data points, we're bringing the data together into a centralized, uh, e easily accessible platform is the key. And uh, uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier on is that HL, if you remember, HL7 was brought in as an integration component for a uh, sharing operational data. And then uh, a fire was brought in to do application level integration where an application can get data from another source. But one of the side effects of fire is fire also brought a normalized data model for patient care. So the instead of every EMR vendor having a different data structures, fire pro provides a basic data structure for an EMR. So getting the data normalized into a database is much easier with the FHIR standards than with HL7 or previous standards or, or EMR-centric data warehouses. And many of you may have data warehouses built uh, around your primary EMR. And uh, it, is, uh, it is very difficult to make decisions using that platform, using data other than that is coming from EMR because there are not a lot of standards around that. And uh, this uh, was standards-based uh, data platform will allow you to bring data from your EMR, from your population health platform, from your IoT devices, your DICOM devices, and other cust consumer and customer facing databases as well. Um, next, uh, is this the last slide, Sue? There is, oh, it's, okay. I think uh, Robert coming back on, I'm assuming. It's up to you, Suresh. Happy to cover it if, if you'd like to give your voice a little bit oh, of a break. Okay. Uh, no, no worries, I can cover this one and then I can uh, uh, bring it back to you. Uh, okay. now, a few things I want to point out. I think uh, one of the advantages of unified data platform is bring not only bring data from your EMR and financial systems as well, and uh, uh, I came from a health system, we had 702 uh, application platforms and uh, getting data into a, a singular unified data, uh, data platform allows you to bring data from those uh, applications as well. Everything from, for example, we had difficulty getting employee health data to HR data to EMR data into a single platform. And uh, it's everything became more complicated with those kind of platforms. And uh, the AI insights, I talked about, about the use case related to uh, the care plan adherence, medication adherence, and uh, uh, compliance. And that kind of AI insights are a lot more effective when you have a lot of data and, and all the data in one platform. And uh, and also, this uh, this uh, one of the clients we worked with, where we are creating this centralized data platform, creating insights which can create specific workloads, and that can be fed back into your operational system. For example, you can see a pattern that this uh, uh, sitter services is not performing in our behavioral health unit, and there is a gap. That alert can be sent to the front end operating system in a real-time basis uh, when uh, needed, based on previously analyzed AI data. And uh, of course, uh, fits into enabling continuous improvement. 
I think uh, we are, like I said, we have used this to do improve uh, current processes based on AI generated uh, um, insights and HIPAA compliance. This is a major issue for a lot of us. I worked with the two different health system where, where I moved a lot of my data to the cloud. I think one of the things uh, Microsoft brings with Azure is uh, uh, high trust compliance. And uh, every platform you build within this Azure stack is uh, high trust certified. So whether data at rest, replication control over uh, your zones, like for example, if you don't want the data to leave your country, uh, if you replication across uh, redundant zones and secure transmission, secure storage. Every aspect of HIPAA is covered. Of course, there is a, a giant responsibility matrix that Microsoft will share with you, which uh, there are certain things that are related to a behavior you have to still manage, like making sure terminated employees are removed, access management is closely watched. And um, I'll turn this back over to Robert. All right. Thank you very much, Suresh. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, I do have a question, and it kind of pertains to what I would call data overload and the age of everything at our fingertips. Um, the the internet, cloud technology, we expect everything to be just immediately there. And I think the pandemic also has driven that, um, accelerated that through hospital and healthcare systems as well. How many people have been vaccinated? How many people do we have in this part of our ER? What's going on here? Um, I know when we work with um, NHS, their reports went from maybe you know, five a week to almost 200 a week because everybody needed data, data, data. How does a healthcare organization or a provider try to rein that in within their organization or what tools can they have to, because uh, everybody wants answers immediately, um, to, to, to put into place to, to kind of keep keep folks at, at, at bay for lack of a better term or will that will that continue because the pandemic has rushed in this immediate more immediate need for answers is that something that you foresee as being an ongoing and accelerating the need for even more and, and better ways to look at data I'll start and Suresh please feel free to jump in as well but Sue it's a great question and here's Here's what we see and we often have to kind of work through with customers is there's there's always a demand for real-time data, but there's a cost, not just a actual monetary cost, but there's a systems cost to putting that level of burden on everything. So what we want to do is make sure we segregate those things that truly require real-time data for real-time decision-making, which is more often related to the care chain than those things that might be more operational in nature. The other really interesting trend that we've been watching is around self-service BI, which is really just a way of saying, centralize all the data, enable users to be able to access the data in a controlled way, layer in governance on top of the data so that there's guardrails on what they're able to do. And that way, what they're usually asking for is real-time access to the data, not necessarily data that's refreshed in real time. So we use these techniques to really try to determine that prioritization layer, as well as the operational business need and the clinical need around that frequency. Suresh, would you yeah. add to that? Well, that's a great answer, uh, Rob. I think part of people's need for real-time access to data versus real-time access, real-time data. I think there is a clear distinction. They want data immediately, but they're not looking for the data as of this minute. Sometimes they are looking for the data as of last night, but I want to see it now. I don't want to wait three hours to run a report. That is what this uh, platform brings you. That That's one thing. Second is that some of the uh, historical insights, AI-based insights, influencing your real-time uh, operations. For example, we built a model for a uh, client where uh, predicting if somebody from a, a medical surgical unit is going to go into ICU. I think the data prediction is based on historical data, based on patients of this conditions and the, may have potential to go to ICU. Using the data to actually uh, apply to current data to predict, okay, we'll keep an eye on these three patients. Uh, but the decision is based on historical data. 
and using that algorithm to identify the new patients on real-time basis. So there is a mixture of those two as well. So I'll pass there. No, good answer, good answer, because you can clearly see so much data, so many reports, and I think, uh, I think Rob, uh, Suresh, both of you framed it very, very well, um, the, the, the need for data that's already there versus the real-time data and separating that and getting those guardrails up, because sometimes it is an access issue versus uh, someone wanting real, real, real-time data, so thank you. All right. And Nellie, do we have any questions or anybody's hands up from the audience? Still not seeing questions or hands at the moment. Let me continue here. Then I'm probably going, we've been on the call here since 11, so uh, looks like we're probably going to just end, uh, end a few minutes early here, give folks back a little bit of bit of time in their day, but just do want to close out and thank everyone for spending so much time with us. We appreciate the time, uh, appreciate um, all of our speakers uh, with the time that uh, that that they've uh, given us and their their knowledge and their expertise. And of course, uh, Tim from Al Rio and Dan from Informed Diagnostics and Tony from Microsoft for sharing real life uh, scenarios as well as looking at the greater uh, 50,000 foot level of really where, where some things are heading in healthcare. Anybody has any follow up, wants to drop any questions to us, uh, us, the email address is on the screen, askacquisitive.com. And we are trained through Microsoft with their catalog, Catalyst program to go through and do envisioning workshops and de design workshops and idea workshops to really look at what is the um, issue, the, the problem, the challenge that the customer has, and then figure out what are the steps forward to, to providing those solutions and leveraging all of the advances with technology to drive that transformation. Uh, so thank you all. We will be following up an email uh, in about a week with link to where the uh, recordings are and just gathering some follow-up feedback from everyone. But thank you, thank you all. And I hope that everybody has a great, a great rest of the day and stay safe.